Good morning. My name is Tom Whitten. I'm an elder here at Cherry Creek Presbyterian Church. Our scripture reading this morning is from the book of Titus, chapter 3, verses 3 through 8. You can find it in the Pew Bible on page 1857. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but by his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. <clears throat> may we hear God's word to us in the reading of this scripture. So normally uh, on, the, on the first Sunday of a, of a new season, we wear robes and we, we have the acolyte bring the Bible in, all is a symbol that we start with the Word. It gives us a new chance to start, but I couldn't quite figure out how I'd do on this stool in a robe. I might just be slowly slipping. <laughs> so, uh, so today you, you get me uh, without my robe. Have you ever been uh, challenged by somebody? You ever had somebody uh, say to you, you know, um, I think you can do better? Uh, you, you hope that they do it with a gen gentle and uh, gracious attitude, not angry and not correcting, but, but just touching the heart. Uh, so about two years ago, a little less than two years ago, a number of elders, we were going through our normal review process, and as, as they got to the end of my review, talking about what we were doing well at the church and uh, there are a lot of things that we were doing well and what's things we could be doing better, and there are always things that you could be doing better. Um, but at the end, they said, well, there's, there's one other thing we want to talk to you about, Brad. Um, we want to talk to you about your health. And I'm like, I think we're out of time. Um, <laughs> no, 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 they were, they were very gracious. And so they, uh, they said, you know, we think you're putting on weight. We think we watch you go up and down those stairs on Sundays, and it's a miserable experience for us. We don't care about you, but it hurts us to watch you. <laughs> and, uh, and so they challenged me as a part of my review to, to get better in health, and, and as I prayed about it and talked to my wife and to my doctor, ultimately the end was you got to start with your knees, because your knees are stopping everything. So this year I've had two knee replacements, and I, I just want to say thank you for those of you that have been praying for me. This one actually seems to be going even better than the last one, and the last one did great. Uh, I can feel the prayers. My, my doctor said, wow, you are really healing well. I said, you don't get it when you have a, when you have a whole bunch of people praying for you. It makes a difference. So uh, he just looked at me like, yeah, right, but I don't care. I know the truth. Um, so I bring that up not to get your pity or to make the service about me, though if I fall over, you'll kind of understand, I guess. Um, but I, I wonder if that's a little more of the attitude that occurred in, in 1517 with Martin Luther. I wonder if a little more, he wasn't trying to start a revolution or a war. He wasn't trying to destroy the church that he had loved. You see, at, at age uh, 20, he had given up his legal career. He was super brilliant. <coughs> Excuse me. And, uh, <coughs> and, and he had... He had already been able to speak five languages at the time that he was 20, and so people thought he was really going to be something, and he, uh, he felt a call to go into ministry, so he became an Augustine monk at age 21, and, 
Um, the honest truth as we look back on Martin Luther's life is he was a little bit paranoid and pretty obsessive compulsive. He was a little off the deep end. And so as he took this step into, into living as a monk, he was just confronted by all the things that were wrong in him, all the things that, that were broken. Um, he, he wasn't the first one to then apply those things to the church. There were a lot of people who had been saying for almost 200 years that the Catholic Church, and by Catholic I mean really the only Western church that there was, had fallen away from its height. People had started to do things that they shouldn't do. Uh, popes were having children out of wedlock, and the amount of affluence and money that was being poured into the, into the churches was, was amazing. Put our television evangelists of today to, to shame. And I think what happened was Martin Luther, after hearing and reading all of these different reformers from all across Europe, Wycliffe and Huss and Erasmus and Luther and Zwingli and Cramner and Tyndall and Calvin, that as a part of this whole movement, he came to the church and he said, something is not working. We, spiritually, we are not moving as we should. Uh, our souls are corrupt. We need a transplant. We need a full replacement. We need something to happen in our souls. And so he, uh, he went to the village bulletin board, which was the door of the Wittenberg Chapel, and he nailed up 95 things that he felt like the church was failing in. Now, we tend to think he wrote down 95 things that they were failing in, but that's not what he did. You see, a lot of the things that he wrote on that list were things that he had been confessing and then struggled with. One, one of the keys was the indulgences. Uh, you, you probably know about this, but um, the Catholic Church, as a part of penance at that time, said you could pay a price, a certain amount of gold, and that would, that would give you penance for whatever sin you had committed. So if you, if you hit your wife, you could pay so much. Or if you did something wrong, or if you stole from somebody in your business, you could pay a penance. And, uh, and if you'd pay a little more, you could actually pay that indulgence ahead of time. So you could pay to get out of your sin and then really, really whack your business partner or really do something evil. And, and Martin Luther had been a part of that. He had been one of the priests that people had been coming to. He was a part of the Catholic Church where people have been saying, here's our money, we're going to go do this. Give me a writ that lets me get out of this. And uh, he was confronted by how, how crazy it was that, that the church was forgiving sins based on dollars, not based on heart or true repentance. And so he wrote up 95 theses, 95 problems that he saw in his church and in his life. And, uh, and taking from all of the things that occurred around Europe, um, the world began to change. Now, it changed for two reasons. Uh, not just because Luther was so good at writing the 95 theses, but, but, at, the, but at the time, uh, there was a brand new piece of machinery on, on the marketplace called the printing press. And so those things which Martin Luther had written could be disseminated out to the people in German, and they could read them. And they could say, yeah, that doesn't seem fair. That doesn't seem right. And, and there was this sense that they could agree with the things that he's posted. Most of the time, a member of, of the church would say, hey, I have a problem, and, and then they would just disappear into obscurity. But because of the printing press, people took these 95 theses and they, they published them all around Germany, and so people began to get behind Martin Luther. Uh, the second thing that occurred at the same time, not something that I think Martin Luther really understood, was there was great anger, uh, not only at the church, but at, out, at the whole leadership in Europe. There, the, the corruption levels of Europe were great, and the average person was angry. And so his 95 thesis becomes kind of the spark that takes their anger, and so there's, there's almost a revolution that takes place, that the villagers begin to get their pitchforks out and march uh, not only on the bishops and the, and the churches, but on the local leaders saying, this is not fair, this is not right, you take advantage of us, and all of that happened, and, and as that fire caught, it became a bunch of protesters trying to change things, and we call it the Protestant Reformation. Uh, I think that if, if Luther or any of the gentlemen that are up there um, 
could have seen all the, the riots that would have taken place, the deaths, the struggles, they would have been deeply, deeply grieved. I think their hope was to try to turn back to God because they recognized something. We all, we all, we all need reformation. Our passage today is one that struck Luther very deeply. It's out of Titus chapter 3. And it says this, at one time we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. Um, I've, I've already shared that Luther was consumed with his own sin. He would often spend five or six hours a day in confession. Um, he, he wanted to get all of it again, and, and he read this passage and he said, this is so true of me. But it struck him it was also true of the Apostle Paul, who was writing to one of the early pastors of the church, Titus. And what Paul said is, we too had all of these issues in us. We too were disobedient. We too were deceived. We too were enslaved by all kinds of passions. We too lived by a law of hate, not by a law of love. I think Luther was convicted that, that the whole church had lost its way, and that included him. And so he began to write out his hope for the church. And, uh, and ultimately, it became a, a battle, and, and Europe divided. Within about 100 years, about half of Europe had turned away from Catholicism and was Protestant. And uh, that led to many, many wars and many, many struggles and many, many difficulties. But out of that were five treasures, what we call the five solas, that I want to be thankful for. I'm not thankful to, for the process. I'm not thankful when the church splits. You know, I, I've been a Christian uh, about three years. I want to tell you how I became uh, a Presbyterian. Uh, I really liked a girl who was a Presbyterian. <laughs> Deep theological reasons, right? It had nothing to do with theology. I knew nothing of theology. I knew that she had dimples and she was cute. And she was going to a Presbyterian church, so I am now a Presbyterian. That's how I chose it. And, and through my, my walk as a Christian, uh, I got saved at a Young Life camp. Uh, I went to a Baptist seminary. Uh, I, I teach in, in an evangelical college. Some of the greatest growth in my life has been through um, Charismatics and Pentecostals who, who showed me that there was a real God who wanted to show up in real time and real places. And I could draw some things from them. Uh, I spent several years in what I called my dead Catholic phase. That's not that I desired any Catholic to be dead. It was that I only read dead Catholics, early church writers, John of the Cross, St. Augustine. And, and that time, along with the, the coaching from a, a Catholic priest, really grew my faith. It's almost as if I had missed a whole section of what was the church. And now one of my closest friends is a Greek Orthodox priest who has said, Brad, you've missed all that happened in Istanbul, in Constantinople. Oh, the things you have yet to read. And, and so I, I think I'm kind of a, a Christian Neapolitan. You know, a little bit of this and a little bit of that mixed in, put a few sprinkles on top, that's kind of me. Um, I, have, I have journeyed this route learning that there are a lot of ways, and I'm sad when the church divides and fights. Um, it was the early 80s. I had been a Christian for just a few years, and this Presbyterian church that I was going to, I showed up one day for a wedding, uh, one of my friends was getting married, and the church had been locked, and there was an armed guard outside, and the wedding could not take place in the church, and so the wedding took place in the parking lot of the church. Because the church was in the middle of a division, and, and the Presbyterian denomination that I had been a part of, that I thought was so good and had so many cute girls at it, um, that denomination was splitting, and I was right in the middle of it, and I didn't quite have a grid for that. I hated what that did. This very church comes out of a church split where somebody at the top of an organization said in Presbyterianism, we don't really think it's important that Jesus was raised from the dead. It's important that you get something from your hope of that, but you don't have to really believe it. And in my little circle, those were fighting words. 
You take away the resurrection, you take away everything. We're a bunch of fools to gather. And so that started this breakdown. And uh, I spent much of my life living through that. Uh, this church has been through several splits based on who the pastor is and who the pastor is not, based on who the worship leader is and who the worship leader is not. We're bad at it, folks. You guys are good people, but we are, as Christians, bad. And we have been since the very beginning of time. So I can grieve for the divisions and hope that, that Lord, we can do better now. But I still want to share five things that came out of some of those divisions which are critical, critical to the, to the faith that you and I profess. And I, I want to go over those. Those are the five solas. Martin Luther was reading 2 Timothy 3, and it says this, all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching and rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Struck Martin Luther, uh, not only was the Bible from God, God inspired, God breathed, but that in the Bible was everything that was necessary, at least according to Scripture, to thoroughly equip the servant of God for every good work. What Luther said is, the Bible is enough. It can fully equip us to live as we are supposed to live. Well, if the Bible is enough, then we really don't need priests and cardinals and churches who tell us this is what you should believe, this is what you should do. That the scripture should be the place that we go when we try to figure out how do we live and what do we do. And <clears throat> out of that simple scripture came this undermining, this underpinning, if you will, of the Reformation called sola scriptura, two Latin words which mean by scripture alone doesn't mean there aren't good teachers. It doesn't mean we don't need to find somebody who can help us understand the Word of God or we don't need to go to classes or churches. But what it does mean is ultimately what I tell you is far, 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 far less relevant than what the Word of God tells you. It's why the Word of God is on the floor given to the people. It's why part of what Luther changed was he he translated the scriptures from Latin into German and he handed them out to people and they could go home and read like the newspaper the very word of God and it began to shake them up. No one had read the word of God for almost 1600 years. And now the world changed as people could actually read that Bible. Um, you sit in a pew and has, there's a Bible in front of you. Do you realize how radical that is? Imagine if the only way you could know what's in that book because it was written in some mysterious language was if I told you or somebody else told you. If there was never a Bible, if you couldn't go to a bookstore and buy a Bible, you couldn't own one, you couldn't mark it, you could never go. What if you had no way of knowing but just finding somebody that taught you? Well, hopefully you'd find somebody smart. Hopefully you'd find somebody humble. Hopefully you'd find somebody good. But if you got somebody a little wrong, Guess what? There's no corrective means to fix it. You and I are deeply blessed because God has given us his word. And it's by scripture alone we chart our course. So if you ever hear me say something that you think isn't really what the Bible says, I want you to come to me and say, Brad, I'm confused. That doesn't match up with what I was just reading or what I think. What I hope I'll give you is a reasonable explanation. It's why in our denomination, you gotta go to seminary. You gotta study the Bible under experts. You gotta learn how to read Greek, read Greek and Hebrew. The reason is we're hoping to be better at reading the Bible, but in truth, you have to challenge me. And you and I have to open the book together and figure out what it says. Now, if it's really by scripture alone, now we have problems too, because honestly, while 98% of the Bible is super, super clear and everybody reads it pretty much the same, there are a percentage of things that I could read it one way and you could read it another way. Good Christians divide on some things. And so once you say it's by Scripture alone, not by what some leader says, then you know what? You gotta be willing to dialogue about those things where you're, you're not so sure, you're not so clear. Sola Scriptura. The first one. The second one, sola gratia, by grace 
alone. I read a study by Pew Research just a few weeks ago that said that uh, 60% of Protestants, evangelicals, believe that you are saved by grace and good works. More than half believe just the grace of God is not sufficient. Well, the reformers would say that's craziness. The only thing that gets us into the kingdom of God is not our behavior, not our lifestyles, not how how often you go to church or whether you paid for a wing at a hospital. It's not how good a person you are to your family or to your friends or to anybody else. The only thing that allows us to be righteous enough to be with God who is perfect is his grace, unmerited favor, a gift, sola gratia, by grace alone. Look at the rest of that Titus passage. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Christ Jesus our Savior, so that, having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. The truth is that it's not because of anything we've done. It's that God in his goodness and mercy has poured out and cleaned us through the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ. And he has invited us into his kingdom. What an amazing leveling that is. Um, How many of you love your children? Okay, now I'm not talking about right now, exactly. I'm talking about generally love your children. Okay, many of you. Um, How many of you love your children unconditionally? Okay, a little more hesitation. I have to tell you that I have committed myself to love my children unconditionally, but I fail all the time at it. I I do love them in the sense that there's nothing that they have to do to earn my love, and I will never disown them. But I will tell you, when they're acting respectfully to their mother, I love them more. When they are making wise choices in their lives, I really appreciate that a lot. When they reflect the glory of God, I love them more. How difficult it is for us as humans to love unconditionally. Um, I know my parents loved me the best they could, but I will tell you that I grew up in a, in a house that was full of performance. You get an A, you're, you're more valuable. You win a trophy, you're more valuable. You exceed in sports, you're more valuable. You win an award or get brought into the National Honor Society, somehow we're more proud. I don't think their message was that we love you only if, but I will tell you that that's what I learned, that performance is a part of what I do. That's why I think that many of us still believe, yeah, God loves us through grace, but I better hold the line. I better do my part. I better do the right thing. And I want to declare to you the gospel, which is that Jesus Christ died for you before you could do anything right, without you ever doing it. The good news, the gospel is that while we were yet sinners, Christ paid off our debts. And we are accepted solely by grace. This changed everything. The church said, no, 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 you're saved if you do these things. And, and we can withdraw things from you, and then you might, your salvation might be in question. If we don't let you take communion, if we won't baptize you, if we won't do these things, you don't get to be in heaven. But, but the reformer said, no, that's not what the scriptures say. It's by grace alone. We're all in. God, as bad as we are at loving unconditionally, is great at it. He sees us as we are. He knows our fallenness and he loves us. We have been justified by his grace. That's the second one, sola gratia. The third one, sola fide, by faith alone. Um, I'm struck sometimes by how we make faith a work. If you just had more faith, you would be healed. If you just had more faith, your marriage will work better. If you just had more faith, your kids would not ever have a a struggle in their lives. It's almost as if we we go back to this belief that there's something we have to do again. And what the Reformation declares is, no, all we do is believe. All we do is say, okay, I'm in. Nothing more than that. 
Nothing less than that. The, the motion is simply an affirmation. It, it comes from a, 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 a Greek word, pistaiou, which means to walk blindfolded. And uh, it comes from a Roman drill. They would, they would put soldiers on a wall five, six, eight feet high, maybe a foot and a half wide, and they'd blindfold them and they'd tell them to march. And their sergeant would call out instructions when they would get to a corner. Turn right now. And if you listened well, if you had faith in the in instruction that you were given, you would turn and stay on the wall. But if somehow you delayed or hesitated, off you went, crash and burn, and then you'd get yelled at and you'd have to get back on the wall again. Well, this sense of faith walking blindfold, it is, is a part of what God, I think, calls us to. Will you trust me? I have so much I want to give you, God says. Will you just trust me? Will you just put your faith in me? And, and it's not a whole bunch of faith. It's not perfect faith. It's not a pile of faith. Uh, you remember Jesus is talking to the centurion, who's, who's not even really a religious man in that, in that story, but he comes to Jesus and he says, uh, Master, my daughter is sick. Would you heal her? And Jesus said, sure, I'll come with you. And he said, no, 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 you, you, I'm a man under authority. I get it. Just say the order and I trust you, I have faith in you. And Jesus is like, wow, I've not seen any faith like this in all of Israel. That little simple faith that you believe that I say it and it's done is enough. Go home, your child is healthy and well. Faith the size of a mustard seed takes a pile of rock that hasn't moved in billions of years and it moves it. It's not about how great your faith is. It's about the simple mustard seed size of faith. When you're in the middle of a struggle, when you're in the middle of a battle, the real question is not how good are you, not how big your faith is, but whether you can say, Lord, here I am, I believe. Help my unbelief. And that is sufficient to be in the kingdom, sola fideo. Romans 1 says it this way. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. From the beginning of our spiritual journey to the end of our spiritual journey, the only question that really matters is, do you believe? Do you believe? I want to encourage you, hang in there. When people tell you don't believe, don't give up your faith. Don't go to church if you don't want to. Don't do a lot of other things, but never, ever, ever give up your faith. You're going to send your kids off to college, and the colleges are going to tell you the one thing you shouldn't leave with is faith. It's because Satan knows if he can take that away from you, he takes away everything. Do not give up your faith. Fourth one, solus Christus, by Christ alone. Um, in the early church, it was Jesus and a priest. You wanted to confess your sins, you needed to come to me and tell me, and I somehow had access to God that was different. But the reformers, as they read the Bible, said, wait, looks like anybody can pray. Like, God will take confessions from anybody. Like, I can just get on my knees and say, Lord, and he hears. David prays, he hears. Other people pray, he hears. Maybe the truth is that there is but one mediator, and that's Jesus, and you don't need to come to somebody else to pray for you. Now, I, I want you to hear how much I love when you come up and say, would you pray for this? Because I want to join with you in prayer. But it's not because I have special access to God. Probably my prayers are worth less to God than your prayers are. I get paid to pray. How good can that be? The reality is that everybody is able to go to the Lord at any time for anything. There is but one mediator. This is what the scriptures say. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man, Christ Jesus. What a privilege to know that you don't have to find the right teacher, the right priest, the right church, the right rabbi, the right pope. There's one right Lord, one mediator, and at any moment he is there to forgive us. There's nobody else that's necessary to forgive your sins or lead your walk. Um, that leads us to this weird phrase that we say when we recite the Apostles' Creed. And we believe in the Holy Catholic Church. 
What we're really not saying is that we believe in some denomination, capital C Catholic. What we're saying is there's a universal church and only Jesus gets to decide who's in. You see, the elders of this church have some sense of, of involvement in who gets to be a member or not. You have to answer questions. You have to have what we believe is true faith. And we, we do control a little bit membership in our church. But I will tell you, we don't control membership in the church. Only Jesus controls it. There's a universal church that is his, and only he gets to decide who's in and out. And as soon as somebody else starts to decide you're in and you're out, this group's in, this group's out, I'm really nervous. There is but one mediator, one person who stands in the gap. So when we recite the Apostles' Creed as has been done since the fourth century, and we believe in the Holy Catholic Church, what we're saying is there's a universal church, and Jesus is the head of it, the mediator. The very last one. Sola Deo Gloria, for God's glory alone. Uh, of the five solas, I love this the most because it means we can't be proud. You know, in reality, we're kind of, we like a little piece of glory, don't we? I want to preach a really good sermon and have a little bit of the glory be mine. Oh, I can say, yeah, most of it was Jesus, but I want you guys to think, wow, he did good. Uh, when, when Douglas plays over there, he's one of the most gifted organists I've ever seen in my life. And I want to say, Douglas, thank you. What an awesome job you did. But what's the truth? When we sing, when we work, when we, when we speak, it's only because God has given us brain cells and an opportunity and a place. Apart from the goodness of God in our lives, Douglas couldn't play a single thing, not with his hands and not with his feet. And I would stand up here and babble like a brook and nobody would understand anything. It's only God's work in us. Everything good that happens in this church is solely because of the good of God and all for his glory. Nobody gets to share the glory of God. When you do a good job loving your, your parents and your grandkids, it's not because you're such a good person. It's because God has blessed you and given you an opportunity and a chance and put the Holy Spirit inside you. Solo, Deo, Gloria. Everything is for God's glory. Bach, when he would write a piece of music, you know, that genius would write at the bottom or the top of it, Solo, Deo, Gloria. This is not about me, Bach says. This is about God. All for the glory of God. Our lives are all for the glory of God. Don't ever be confused that there's some church or person that's better. Sola Deo Gloria is what we carry from the Reformation. Ah, uh, there but for the grace of God, we would never make it. Sola Deo Gloria, all for the glory of God. In uh, 1936, a, a young Baptist preacher took a tour of Israel with some of his colleagues, and he was shaken by what he saw and by how real scripture came alive. And then as the second part of their journey, they went to Germany and he, he got to visit where Martin Luther had written down some of his theses and see those places. And this young American from Georgia was so struck, this black Baptist preacher was so overwhelmed that he got back to the States and he went down to the courthouse and he changed his name and he took on Martin Luther's name. He changed his name to Martin Luther King. And within a few weeks, he went back down to that courtroom and he changed his son's name to Martin Luther King Jr. You see, the legacy of the Reformation goes on. And part of what allowed Martin Luther to stand and talk about freedom was his belief that God is the only mediator. We don't get to judge each other. What is his belief that it's only through grace you get saved, not because some are better and some are worse. This, this sense of change that was necessary, this sense of hunger for reformation, I think came to Martin Luther King Jr. through his father and maybe through his namesake, the sense that all of us need to change. My brothers and sisters, the challenge for us today is do we see the reformation as a thing that happened a long time ago? Or do we see the Reformation as the thing that can happen today in my life and in my heart? Let's pray.
Father, thank you for the people who have gone before us and who have uh, paved the way for our faith. Forgive us when we believe that we are better than others, when we stand in judgment of some other church or some other group because we think we've figured it exactly out right. Lord, forgive us. May we have the heart that comes from Jesus which says, I love my children just the way they are. Lord, help us be gracious. May we be students of Scripture. May we seek out to understand your way, Lord, but may we never seek to serve you to earn our favor. For you have given us grace and faith, and that is enough. Come now, work this in your people. We ask this in Jesus' name.